cord. Fabulous, lovely. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me while I set that up. Hmm. One moment, please. Now, is that, are these, uh, is the slide deck visible? Yes, excellent. So welcome everybody. This is our third webinar in a four webinar part series uh, really focused on affordable housing is a climate solution. And today we are drilling down into financing net zero. Uh, and this is this event is co-hosted uh, uh, by MCAN and Boston Society for Architecture. And for those of you that don't know anything about MCAN or forget about MCAN, we were founded a while back in 2000 and we work uh, across the state with our chapters uh, to really make local level change that can influence what happens at the state. So we are a grassroots organization um, and the past year we have developed uh, a campaign called Affordable Housing is a Climate Solution. So we work with advocates at the local level, we have social media toolkits, we have um, uh, we use webinars uh, and other outreach efforts to really try to connect uh, housing advocates, uh, whether they're in the design profession or the building science profession with clean energy advocates, uh, because we really believe that affordable housing is part of the climate movement, is a climate solution. Buildings from a uh, climate perspective or a problem, their major source of emissions, affordable housing uh, is also a problem in terms we're not making enough of it, we're not producing enough of it, and we're not sufficiently preserving what we already have. These two issues come together in this webinar series. And so we have invited over the past three webinars, uh, speakers from the design fields, uh, from the energy equity fields, uh, and now from the financing fields to come and share tools, share strategies, share design projects uh, to really push forward on this affordable housing is a climate solution campaign. And we have been so fortunate uh, to partner with Jenny Efron and Wandi, uh, who works with Jenny uh, at the Boston Society for Architecture. So with that, I will pass the mic to Jenny. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Um, in case you didn't know about the BSA, um, we are both the local AIA chapter and also a 501c3 organization. We have 4,500 members and um, we focus around youth education, collaborative community design and advocacy opportunities. Um, next slide. And some of our key focus areas are climate and environment and the work around design for climate resiliency and climate adaptation, um, including recently a focus on uh, carbon and embodied carbon and have a actually around embodied carbon, a uh, somewhat new uh, knowledge community to sort of to work on embodied carbon and put the conversation forward when we're talking about getting to our carbon neutral goals. It's um, the Climate Leadership Forum. And so there will be upcoming events with the city of Boston and this day as we continue to support their work for carbon neutral zoning as well. Uh, next slide. Another of our focus areas is housing and um, our work in housing is led by Wandi Pasqual, who's a two-year housing fellow that we are partnering with the city of Boston's Housing Innovation Lab to pilot ideas to create opportunities for affordable housing. We recently had a um, exhibition called The Future Decker that you can still see on our website. And as part of that, um, had a discussion around sustainability along with also another event with Mass CEC's Triple Decker Challenge. So really bringing home the issues of affordable housing, um, sustainability, and how we bring those things together to create healthy communities and opportunities for everybody. So I will now pass along to our first speaker today, Brenda Pike, who is a climate advisor for the city of Boston's environment department. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jenny. And before we do pass the mic to you, Brenda, I just want to quickly uh, go over the agenda for today. Uh, we will have our first speaker, uh, Brenda Pike, City of Bo uh, Climate Advisor for the City of Boston's Environment Department. 
And Brenda will be talking about the PACE program. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. You will know by the end of this webinar. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, Brenda will also talk about a new tool um, that I am frankly uh, very excited about. And following Brenda, we will hear from Travis. Uh, Travis Anderson, the Director of Innovative Design at Place Taylor, a really interesting firm uh, here. So following their presentations, uh, we will do a moderated question and answer. So as you listen to Brenda and Travis and you have questions, I really encourage you uh, to put them into the chat. And then once both speakers have uh, concluded, um, their presentations, we will then have a, a question and answer period. Uh, I will stop us at about 10 uh, to one uh, because I wanna touch base on two advocacy opportunities for folks. So we always try to end these webinars with actions that uh, folks who have joined the call uh, can take. So with that, I now pass the mic to you, Brenda. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides so that you can share yours, Brenda. Thank you. Um, let me pull this up. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, thank you for, for having me today. So um, as I think everyone probably knows by now, the city of Boston brings citywide. Um, and people can argue about whether that's too ambitious, not ambitious enough, but um, as you can see here, we have a lot of work to do. Um, um, and, uh, you, and you can see also that um, large buildings make up the majority of emissions in a city. Um, so we're really very focused on um, these large buildings as a, a primary place to focus uh, our efforts here. And so while the city is working on, on their buildings, they also wanna make sure that the private building owners have the ability to, to meet these goals as well. And when we look at resources available to existing buildings, we, we know there's a lot out there, but that there are also gaps in that. So for existing funding options, um, we know about incentives uh, through the Mass Safe Program, SMART, Mass CEC. Um, we know about tax credits available like the Solar ITC, LIHTC, the Historic Tax Credit. Um, and there are lots of financing options out there as well, um, but they may not match the long-term timeframes of these energy upgrades um, or have enough confidence in the savings that are projected for them to, to underwrite based on that. Um, so I'm here today mainly to talk about a couple of new financing options that the city has available for building owners, um, the tax exempt lease and, and property assessed clean energy. And I'll also touch briefly on a couple of things that the, the city is currently exploring. Um, so the, the tax exempt lease product or, or TELP um, is low interest financing for nonprofits offered by the Boston Industrial Development Financing Authority. Um, tax exempt leases offer the lowest interest rates available because they're, the interest earned is, is exempt from federal income tax, state income tax, alternative minimum taxes. And so the lenders pass that savings on. Um, interest rates tend to be, I think about 1.5 points below the, the commercial average. Um, the security for this lease is the actual equipment that it's, that's installed. Um, and the difference from tax exempt bonds um, is these are not subject to the statewide volume cap that tax exempt bond issuances have um, and a rating and a public offering document aren't required for it. Terms can be as long as 20 years, but they're limited to the useful life of the equipment installed. Um, and the energy savings have to cover the lease payments. So this requires a performance contract with a savings guarantee with an energy services company or ESCO um, that's approved by the state's division of capital asset management and maintenance. And if you have an ESCO in mind that isn't already approved by DCAM, you can make their case to the BITFA board for approval. I know that the one app ESCO has already done that. 
Um, because of the nature of performance contracts, this tends to be a better option for larger projects in the you know, one to $2 million range um, minimum. Um, although of course it depends on the economics of the, the individual project. Uh, more information about this is available on the BIDFA website, bostonbusinessloans.org slash BIDFA. Um, and I know that we have uh, Bill Nickerson and Gisela Soriano from BIDFA on the call today to help answer any questions later on. Okay, so moving on to PACE. Um, so PACE is financing available for commercial, industrial, nonprofit, and multifamily buildings that are five or more units. Um, this is a state program that Boston has opted into. And the way this works is that the building owner will apply to mass development for funding. Um, after mass development approves the funding, this, they issue bonds to, to private lenders. And then the city collects the payments for this along with the property tax payments um, and passes that through to mass development and the lender. Um, again, the term is 20 years or the useful life of the, the measures installed, um, but there's no savings guarantee required for this. So you don't have to do a performance contract. Uh, DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, reviews the projected savings um, and confirms that they're reasonable. Um, because there's no performance contract and the, the administrative costs involved with that, um, the projects can be smaller with a minimum of $250,000. And again, the maximum is the projected energy savings. Um, because this is a lien on the property that's primary to the mortgage, um, it requires consent from the mortgage holder. Um, and one feature of this that, that's interesting is ideally if the property is sold, the PACE assessment remains with the property um, as long as the new mortgage holder consents. Um, if not, it would be paid off at the time of sale like, a, like any mortgage would be. Um, and I think importantly, it, it can't be accelerated. So if there's a default, only the, the current unpaid amount can be collected. And more info on this is available at, at massdevelopment.com slash PACE. Um, and I know that Marianne McCormick, Marianna McCormick uh, from Mass Development is on the line today to, to help answer questions later on. Um, and I mentioned that we're exploring other options, although I, I want to have a uh, you know fine print here. There's no guarantee that these will um, that these will actually materialize, but these are things that we are are currently working on. Um, so these include a local climate bank. Um, the idea of that is it would leverage public and philanthropic funds to crowd in private investment um, through things like credit enhancement, co-investment, aggregation, and it would focus on building owners who have difficulty funding clean energy upgrades, such as affordable housing or smaller nonprofits. Um, and you've probably already heard plans for uh, emissions performance standard for, for larger buildings um, that the city is, is currently working on. Um, and we're looking at using alternative compliance payments from that uh, to decarbonize, to set up a fund that can will then be used to decarbonize payments, to decarbonize buildings. And um, there will be a review board that would look at um, how the, the fund would be used um, that would include community members. Um, again, the focus here would be helping under resource buildings like affordable housing. So those are two things that we're currently looking into, maybe available down the road, something to keep an eye out for. Um, and here is my contact info. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I know I won't be your last stop for this, but I can make sure you're in touch with the right people. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, I know at MCAN, uh, 
increasingly because we have this affordable housing as a climate solution, we get a lot of questions about PACE. Um, so this is, this is very helpful. Uh, so with that, Brenda, I'll ask that you stop sharing your screen and uh, we will now uh, hear from Travis Anderson and uh, Travis, uh, just as a reminder, he is the Director of Innovative Design at a firm called Place Taylor. And with that, Travis, I will yield the microphone to you. And you are on mute, Travis, just so you know. Sorry, I'm trying to get my screen set up here. One second. All set, can you see my, my slides? Great. Hello everybody, uh, I'd like to thank the BSA and uh, MCAN for inviting me to this fantastic series. Um, I'm Travis Anderson, uh, Director of Innovative Design at Place Taylor, uh, also the in-house uh, certified passive house consultant. Um, I'm just gonna go over some pretty high level uh, concepts and strategies that we've developed over the years at Place Taylor and also that um, we addressed during a, a study uh, that we did with DND, Department of Neighborhood Development, uh, almost a year, over a year ago now, uh, around affordable housing and coming up with specific strategies for zero emission buildings. So Place Taylor, uh, for those of the, you who don't know, we're actually a family of co-ops. Um, we have three, actually now four distinct branches within our company. Um, PTEH is our architecture design company. Um, we officially merged with Elton Hampton Architects, an affordable housing uh, firm that's worked for a number of years here in Boston uh, to kind of expand our affordable housing portfolio. Uh, PT Red is our uh, Place Taylor real estate development entity. And then PT Builds is our construction. We also just recently launched what we call PT Tech, uh, where we're actually uh, looking at advancements in technology um, to kind of to f further uh, the battle against climate change, really. I mean, we're looking at uh, ways in which we can introduce new tech um, to, the, to the built environment, and especially around retrofits. Uh, so you might hear more about that someday soon, hopefully. Um, I always like to start these with a little carbon 101, just so everybody's on the same page what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about carbon. Uh, it's a colorless, odorless gas, um, often referred to as CO2 or CO2E. CO2E will um, include other things like uh, methane and nitrous oxide within um, what is being released into the atmosphere, typically by fossil fuels and, as we all know, is, is mostly uh, person-made. Uh, we are currently at an imbalance um, in our environment because of this, uh, so due to the, the releases of the built environment, transportation, all those things we hear about constantly, um, and our, our natural systems are out of balance. So the CO2E can't be naturally absorbed back into, um, you know, taken out of the atmosphere. And unfortunately, last week, we reached a record 421 parts per million, uh, a first ever uh, not so great uh, milestone in our history of measuring um, CO2. Uh, also to point out that about 20% of uh, emissions come from housing uh, within the Boston, Somerville, and Cambridge area. Um, and we're actually really pointing toward, and I think the effort of MCAN and probably everyone on this call uh, is looking at ways to address uh, zero emission buildings and, and the future of housing. Um, and I'm just gonna run through some kind of brief strategies on how we get to net zero or to zero emissions. So what do we mean by this? Uh, we look at it in a few different parameters. We can say uh, zero net energy on site where the total building uh, or infrastructure involves can actually have enough renewable energy on site to help compensate for the operational energy used. So that way it just kind of nets out. We can do on site 
plus offsite. So we're actually looking at two renewable energy sources. One would be that onsite source, and then another one could be an offsite source that you can either get through uh, Rex or even through portfolioing your project with other projects as a developer. Uh, we also like to call uh, projects ZNC ready or zero net carbon ready by having them focus on being an all electric building. They may or may not be able to implement the renewable energy at that time just due to cost um, or other uh, project um, implications. But that way the building can actually can be converted over to zero net energy in time. Um, and then there's also the ZNC convertible where we're, we've seen a lot of strategies lately where you might have um, electric heating and cooling, but you're still using uh, gas or fossil fuel as your hot water source. So ideally the, the project team would work to make that heat, domestic hot water source convert over to electrical consumption um, in due time, maybe as new technologies or, or it's just more um, cost feasible. Um, again, a year, about a year, little over a year ago, we did a, a project with the Department of Neighborhood Development to kind of analyze best practices around uh, zero net carbon. Um, and Place Taylor did this in conjunction with um, a colleague, Colin Schles at Thornton Thomas SETI. Um, and we were just kind of following these guidelines that were put out by an RFP um, from the city. So from that, we just kind of developed uh, a really some key strategies and simple standards to start follow. Um, we also produced a zero emission guidebook um, that you can find online um, at the, I think through the DND website and also the Boston Climate website um, that you can download and, and kind of use as guiding principles. So these are very over, you know, very kind of one architecture 101, things that we kind of learn early in our architecture career, but it's important for us to kind of reiterate them and, and look at these key strategies. So we actually focus on passive house principles. So thermal bridge free design uh, with optimized insulation, passive cooling strategies, air tightness is pretty critical. Um, and a lot of our studies and a lot of our colleagues are finding that you can't make the building too airtight. Um, and in doing so, you're actually helping reduce operational costs. Um, quite a bit by increasing air tightness. Heat exchange ventilation is another key component. So as we make the building airtight, we wanna make sure that we're still getting nice, fresh quality air into the house for the occupants or the, or the dwelling units. Um, and also that we're able to capture that heat um, as it goes in and out of the building. So we can kind of retain kind of this optimal thermal comfort overall. And of course, rooftop PV uh, is another very important component of this because that goes back to the whole zero net strategies. So simplified massing, uh, here we can see, you know, you want a nice cube surface to volume ratios are great. Uh, or you, if you start to have lots of ins and outs and twists and turns in the building, it's going to be harder in many ways to create that thermal bridge free design or look at optimized air, air um, tightness details. Uh, orientation, of course, uh, often really hard to do on urban infill, but if there's any way in which you can strategize the massing uh, to optimize for orientation, stretching out roof planes, uh, you know, bumping up light monitors, anything you can do architecturally to sort of help the daylighting um, and um, solar heat gain strategies for the building. Uh, we also uh, find that density is a really important factor here. The more people that we can comfortably put in a building, like especially with a lot of micro units coming on, making things more affordable um, because we kind of have more units within the building, but also we're actually able to house more people in a building that is zero net energy. Uh, part of our study, we looked at breaking down a per person metric. Um, so we're actually looking at the carbon footprint per person within a building within the study that we did. Uh, optimized glazing, so window to wall ratios. Uh, we found that a uh, uh, 15 to 18 or, or even a little bit higher within like 22% of a, of a window to wall ratio in housing actually makes it so you can reduce other envelopes. So you could decrease um, your R values in your walls. Um, and you actually might not have to go for the fancy triple glaze windows. You might be able to get away with a good double glaze system and that all reverts back to cost. And of course, air tightness. Uh, so again, this is reflected of the simplified massing. 
it's easier to achieve that kind of 0 0.06 CFM 50, which is more of like a, the passive house metric that we're actually targeting here. Um, but in order to, to reach that, thinking about clear, simple details and simplified massings to make that achievable, especially because of the quality control that's needed for this on site. Uh, touch really briefly on systems. Let me know if I'm going on too long because I know we want to pay attention to time. Okay. Um, so again, we're looking at all electric, so heat pump, hot water heating, uh, an ERV or a energy recovery ventilator, heat recovery ventilator, um, and heat pump systems either uh, ductless or ducted um, as part of your heating and cooling strategies. Uh, the important thing here is to note that all these come with uh, levels of efficiency and the more that you can find efficiency in good systems, um, a, that can actually help um, decrease the overall envelope assemblies again. So you're increasing efficiencies on the system side um, and you're kind of working with that in relation to the rest of the envelope. So as we see the increase of efficiency, you're not only um, helping with energy consumption, you're also helping with operational use and costs. So a heat pump, you can get 200 to 400% efficient. Uh, electric baseboard heat is 100% efficient. That means it's just a one-to-one -one ratio of what is used and what is uh, uh, delivered to the site. And uh, in a typical new gas furnace, you're actually below that 100% level at 98% efficiency. Um, so as the arguments continue around hot water and the discussions around hot water, we can see that just by increasing efficiency on the heat pump side, you're actually having long-term gains overall. If you look at, you know, if you look at a project from five to 10 to 20 years out, um, as uh, electricity costs comes in parity with gas and fossil fuel, um, you're actually going to be ahead of the game by uh, using heat pump now. <clears throat> Balanced ventilation, this goes back to the HRV or ERV. Another critical component just for um, indoor air quality, there's lots of discussions around that, especially as we look at small particulate matter here um, in urban environments. Uh, PPM 2.5 is one that you hear a lot, um, especially with if you're in the flight path from Logan. Um, and having these filtered systems, fresh filtered systems actually is, is been shown to reduce asthma and there's all significant benefits to just health and wellness in the building. Um, it's important to note that this is not directly tied to the heating and cooling system. Sometimes they are held separate. Sometimes they can uh, be integrated systematically. Um, but again, this is just a, a, another component that we're looking at. Um, and of course, everyone's here because what does this cost? What does this mean? Um, so real brief, um, not to get into too much of the technical details of our study, uh, Colin and I actually used um, the Woofy modeling software, which is Passive House uh, modeling software, and he had a effectively a hack for it. So we were able to turn it into a parametric modeling um, system. So we were able to model five different typologies up to 40 or 50,000 times within about an hour's time each um, and look at and analyze different iterations of uh, these housing types. So we could see what happens if we increase the wall R value or, or and decrease the roof R value and play with um, different glazing packages and, and look at it as it kind of goes through and kind of threads this needle um, through the projects um, to reach that zero carbon level that we're looking for. And we also looked at this in terms of cost. So these were actually real life uh, buildings that we were modeling. Um, oops. And what we concluded was, um, we saw about a less than 1% to just over 2% cost increase overall when we kind of thread the needle and find the opti optimal um, formula, basically, um, for these buildings to reach zero emissions. Um, this trend has been ongoing, actually. Um, recently, last month, um, uh, BE Plus, uh, kind of pooled everybody together to deliver their best in class projects as we uh, worked 
um, to kind of push for the climate bill to be signed uh, by the state. And um, again, the current trend lines were that we were seeing a 1% to 2% increase or even less in some cases. Um, of that million uh, of that square footage, the 7 million square feet that was analyzed, 1 million of that or so was affordable housing. Um, and uh, you can see here that the percent change was below 1%, 0%, or just above or around 1% increase overall in the affordable housing sector. And these projects that we're looking at was anything from Pacifow certified to pre-certified projects, energy positive projects. Um, and again, it, it kind of comes back to those base principles and strategies we, I showed you earlier. Uh, Operational costs is an, usually another concern. Uh, within our study, we saw a typical reduction of about 20% overall across the typologies and operational costs. And that's when we combine heating, cooling, and, and uh, domestic hot water kind of in one lump. So if the, if the CDC or developer was holding and they were um, actually including those costs within the rent, uh, then that operational cost could be um, considered part of their um, investment in the project. Uh, we've also seen that once renewable energy gets added, you can have a return on that investment within three to five years, which is a uh, pretty short term. Um, and I've seen agreements that range from 30,000 to 100,000 in operational savings um, over the 25 years of the PV system. Sometimes it's even much, much larger than that. Um, a great resource for this um, is uh, Resonant Energy has their impact report that they put out and they've been doing a lot of work um, around the region with um, different cities, city of Cambridge, and I think they've also been doing great work with LISC. Uh, so kind of overall, just to target the key strategies we're talking about, um, early and integrated project teams are, are very, very helpful in keeping cost and control. Um, so you can do these early upfront feasibility studies, uh, taking advantage of what's uh, available now with Mass Save and the Passive House Feasibility Program, as well as the other incentives they have is a great thing to uh, look into. Um, verify those model assemblies with the energy model or CPH3 throughout the design process. Um, develop effective um, and efficient uh, MEP systems um, uh, with, your, with your consultant. Um, refer to best practice for guidance. Uh, work with a GC throughout to have this cost analysis done um, and involve renewable energy uh, early on in DD. Um, it, we found that you know, if, you, if you're able to kind of isolate zones in the roof and allocated that for PV right off the bat, you're ahead of the game. Um, and this integrated practice really comes from a lot of our, you know, kind of going back to where we are as a company with our three distinct elements, having the developer, the designer, and the builder all in house. We've kind of proven this out for the past 10 years that this is an effective strategy to help um, cost, keep costs in line in the market. Um, architecturally simple, elegant design. Um, and then I think think that on-site QAQC is a really, really important um, thing to address. If you're going for certification, you'll get that through the third party verifier, uh, but also it's something to look at and train. There's training opportunities for project managers, construction managers, um, even kind of the, if you think about the next generation of the labor force and construction that's out there to train them and, and make them aware of all these things. I know Roxbury Community College is launching a, a program uh, focused on this and it, it's really great. Another thing that we are working on a little bit behind the scenes is sort of uh, a training kit for uh, people to use. So as these buildings come online, it's really important for property managers and even the occupants to kind of understand how they work. Um, yes, they are simple, but they're still different and they take a little bit to get used to. And um, no matter what kind of project we do, whether it's a high-end single family home um, to just like a cabin, basically. Um, we're always needing to train the people that are starting to use this building um, because it does behave differently and you need to just kind of work with it in different ways. So that is it. Uh, you can take a screenshot of my contact if you want to get into the weeds of any technical details. I'm always happy to do so.
Excellent, Travis. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks to Brenda as well. There are several questions in the chat that I want to lift up. And, um, and I will start actually, um, you know, one of the purposes of uh, bringing design professionals together with clean energy, energy equity advocates is to develop a shared language. Um, and so uh, Michelle from Sierra Club, hey Michelle, uh, she asks uh, uh, Travis, you know, could you, <clears throat> excuse me, could you explain MEP, DD, QA, and QC? That would be really helpful. Yes, definitely. Yeah, sorry, I, I tend to use a lot of acronyms. Um, MEP is just uh, mechanical, electric, and plumbing. So that would be all your systems. Um, QA, QC, quality con control, quality assurance. Um, so, you know, just looking at best practice on site. And then what was the other one? Oh, DD. So SD would be schematic design for in kind of architectural terms, it's early design. Design development or DD phase is kind of when you're midstream and starting to work on the details, uh, come to resolutions. And then a CD or construction documents um, would be kind of your, your final uh, set that would be passed off to the general contractor. Excellent, thank you so much. Renee has a question, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and Renee asks, uh, and this is, uh, well, we'll start with you, Travis. Uh, how can a municipality work to develop best management practices uh, and implement them in the permitting process? So that's the first part of Renee's question. It's a really interesting question. And secondly, are there grants, and Brenda, you may be uh, the person to respond to this one, are there grants that can help with devising um, requests for proposals that can attract developers to build net zero affordable housing, um, as well as subsidies for local government to defray the cost of building affordable housing? So actually, let's start with you, Travis. And again, that question is, how can municipalities work to develop best management practices and implement them in the permitting process? Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, it's something that we talked uh, a little bit about during the DND work was looking at if we could, uh, there could be a, a kind of a high performance uh, code official or, or train someone that's a little bit more specialized um, so they know how these buildings, what to look for in these buildings and add that kind of extra level of quality control um, through inspections um, and also, you know, just use that to help educate the staff and educate um, new people that are coming on board in the city. Um, I don't know. I thought it was a really interesting idea, um, especially because it would allow practitioners to also engage in, in dialogue um, um, as they enter permitting and, and kind of have like a good back and forth there. Um, that's, what, that's one strategy I thought could be effective. Great, thank you, Travis. And another one, uh, Renee, I know City of Newton, for example, has hired an energy coach um, and uh, they do some of this work. Um, I'm going to uh, pivot to Brenda. And once again, are, Brenda, do you know of, you know, within the city of Boston, for example, are there specific grants that can help with crafting an RF, uh, a request for a proposal that attracts developers to build net zero affordable housing? Um, that is a good question. I, I have been very focused on retrofitting existing buildings. I know that Travis is, is, was talking about new construction, um, but the, the financing that I was talking about is definitely for retrofits. Um, I know it's very important to, you know, be very upfront when you're choosing your, um, you know, your contractors and, and setting the goals high. So um, Renee is right that like, getting it uh, incorporated into that RFP process when during the selection is really important. Okay, thank you, Brenda. And FYI, everybody, uh, the Newton's uh, energy coach is on the call. Um, so here she is, uh, Leora uh, Silks. 
excellent. Um, so that's really wonderful. Nice to have you on this call. Uh, there are some other questions uh, that I want to raise. Let me uh, scooch back up here. Uh, there's been some exchange on the Mitsubishi um, heat pump. So Maria Wilkins, uh, Travis, I think this you're the best person to respond to this question. Are there hot water heat pumps available for larger buildings? Um, and there was some exchange from uh, other folks on the call that said Mitsubishi just introduced some hot water heat pumps for larger buildings in the North American market. Uh, and do you have any insights or comments about that, Travis? Yeah, Mitsubishi Train is one to keep an eye on. Also, uh, Colmec, C-O-L-M-A-C is another manufacturer. And Aramec, which is A-E, RMEC is a, another um, manufacturer for, for larger scale heat pumps. You can also use uh, Sandin systems, which are a CO2 heat pump system, more for residential, uh, but you have to have a really good uh, designer work with you uh, for the controls for that, because uh, you have to make it so the control systems for the Sandins um, will work um, at a larger scale, because you you kind of run them in tandem and they need to communicate with each other uh, properly. Um, those are probably the highest efficiency out there right now. They have like a four. So that means they're 400 or 410% efficient, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Interesting. And, and just to uh, make sure I understand, Travis, it's Sandins. That's the residential technology. Yeah, S-A-N-D-E-N. -E I know that uh, Stephen Winters, um, Rob Aldrich of Stephen Winters has been doing some case studies down in New York City. Okay. Um, so he's going to sort of poke at around him. Okay, great. And I think related to this discussion, uh, nice to have you on the call, Laura Spark. Uh, Laura, you had a question about uh, a certain metric that Travis had presented. Uh, if you could bring yourself off of mute, you could ask your question. I feel like I don't have enough info in the chat to accurately oh. reflect your questions. Sure. I was just wondering, um, when you said 20% reduction in operating costs, um, what you were, which is great, what the assumption was there, what was 20% uh, reduction with what was um, installed to get those reductions. Ah. Um, is that, you know, a heat pump? Is that a heat pump and PV? Uh, I just wasn't sure what, what you were looking at. Right, yeah, we were looking at all electric heat pump systems for that and comparing it to if you did a, a traditional, more traditional uh, fossil fuel-based systems, if you were to do a code. Um, we were also, continue to do a lot of research around hot water costs because I know that's constantly in debate um, and to find best practices there. Um, what we've heard recently is that if you do more of a um, decentralized system, uh, so you're actually looking at maybe more individual tanks uh, in a project, especially if you're at a smaller scale, like say, 20 units to 30 units, you could get away with that. And um, it reduces the energy that the pumps would use that would be typically found in a, in a centralized system. Um, there's been quite a few post-occupancy research done on a, on, on a few projects around that. And they see that there's an advantage to the individual tanks. Interesting. Thank you, Travis. Uh, did that did that answer your question, Laura? Yes. Excellent. Glad you're on the call. We have another question from uh, from Kurt Newton, and the question, and I again believe this is for you, Travis, and the next one is for you, Brenda. Uh, how big is the lift for uh, training local labor at, frankly, at the scale and at this accelerated pace? Uh, that we need to hit for both city and statewide uh, CO2 emissions uh, reductions goals? I think it's a huge lift, actually. Um, we've been fortunate to have a good relationship with the uh, carpenters local here in Boston. Um, and I think, you know, they're very interested in this and 
you know, will train their staff and can use their training center for that. Um, other kind of up and coming, I think the, what I mentioned with Roxbury Community College, um, technical schools are a great thing to look into. The uh, issue that we've been finding now in our construction industry is labor is scarce and it's harder and harder to find skilled labor. Um, so I think getting younger people interested in going into the trades um, and kind of, I'm hopeful that this sort of technical aspect to building where you're kind of more of a thinking builder um, will engage more um, people to get involved or maybe transition to it as a, as a new career. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge. Um, we're also looking at, that's why technology and panelization is a big thing um, because you can use new technologies with um, less skilled labor. So you're kind of working alongside the, the robot per se in order to fab prefabricate things, um, but you're also doing it in a much safer uh, kind of factory setting, um, which our carpenters would love to do because they're all getting old and their knees hurt. So if they don't have to, you know, stick frame a house all day long, I think they'd be pretty happy. <laughs> <clears throat> That's very interesting. I hadn't uh, thought about that uh, as a way to kind of as a workaround with aging uh, laborers and the, the scarcity of um, younger laborers coming up and uh, going into apprentice programs and things like that. So that's really interesting. I will share with folks on the call that one of them cans and Corey Thompson, I believe is on the call this afternoon with us. So, hey, Corey. Uh, MCAN, uh, when the um, EEAC, the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, which is the um, entity that really sets uh, the mass save budget up for the next three years, when they were holding listening sessions uh, earlier in the fall, uh, MCAN actually worked with RCC and ben uh, BFIT, Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, and a series of other um, nonprofit entities really committed to requesting that there be more state investment in workforce development programs. So when we think about this ecosystem of both retrofitting and new construction of net zero buildings, uh, the workforce, the labor, the training, and the prioritizing of folks uh, coming off of fossil fuel jobs and those folks coming out of environmental justice in gateway cities is really important um, as part of our our ecosystem of advocacy work. So I do wanna give a shout out about that. Um, I also want to jump back uh, to Brenda. So there is a question about TELP uh, and this is from William Nickerson. So the question about financing uh, industrial buildings. So TELP can be used for institutional financing and for industrial, if the company qualifies as a manufacturer under the CFR. And what is the CFR? Oh, the, the CFR, that would be the, the, the regulations that, that put this into place, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah well, Bill was just uh, clarifying a question that someone had had earlier. Great. Uh, I did see a question oh, sorry, earlier well, on asking about, um, yes, uh, can, can the PACE program be used for, for a nine unit condo? Um, so, I mean, the building, in terms of building size, it would qualify for that. It, it's complicated. The, the condo ownership, I think, complicates it um, because the repayment goes on the, the, the tax, along with the tax payment. Um, but I would defer to Mariana McCormick here from Mass Development. Yeah, I, actually, that's always one of the stickier questions. Um, if they have sort of a unified heating system, there's some situations where it could work out. But just the nature that, as Brenda said, it, it's treated as a betterment assessment, so it appears as a tax. And the condo owners usually get individual taxes, so it makes it a, a heavy lift. But for rental units, um, that PACE is a great um, opportunity. Um, almost any other commercial entity out there, including nonprofits, it's um, an alternative financing that 
you know, since it's treated as a betterment assessment can be done off book and offers a lot of opportunities. Unfortunately, condos are a little sticky or um, any municipal buildings are also not eligible because they don't get a tax bill. But um, almost any other situation, we would entertain a conversation. Right, very interesting. I hadn't quite made connected all those dots. Got it, very interesting. Well, I'm so glad you were on the, the call, Mariana. I really appreciate your, your, um, your comment there. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to, um, uh, we're gonna capture uh, the chat. We're gonna uh, send out a link uh, to the recording. We have recorded this and we will send out a unified slide deck. So you'll get the slides from Jenny and myself, from Brenda and from Travis. Um, and I do want to share my screen one more time. And I want to uh, close us out today. Let me bring the chat down. Uh, close us out today with action items that, uh, again, reminding folks that one of the reasons Jenny Wandy and myself got together around let's do a joint uh, webinar series is to really bring together um, different constituent groups, different bases that from our perspective really have similar values around how we can transform our built environment. Uh, and um, MCAN has been working on uh, an easy code and net zero stretch code uh, for the past two and a half years. And lo and behold, uh, if you listen to Governor Baker and you really listen to Secretary Theoharides during the climate bill signing, signing uh, they did not use the language of net zero stretch code. They in fact use the language of high energy performance code. And those two things are not necessarily the same kind of building in the end, the same kind of code. So uh, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, um, this is the entity that historically has promulgated uh, building code in the state. Uh, they have an upcoming May meeting. It's not yet posted on their website. Uh, the upcoming May meeting will uh, be focusing on uh, the base code. So there is a base and a stretch code in Massachusetts. And right now with improvements in the base code, it's gonna be uh, more stringent than the existing stretch code. And so MCAN wants to move that stretch code so that it's more stringent than our base code. And the stretch code is the ceiling beyond which uh, municipalities cannot uh, require anything else um, uh, from, from, from uh, buildings. Um, so in this May meeting of the BBRS, there will be mostly comments about improving uh, the base code with the IECC uh, vote. However, this is also uh, Better Buildings Advocate's first opportunity uh, in this public comment period um, uh, to make clear your desires for a net zero stretch code. And MCAN, we have a lot of materials and we actually have an upcoming net zero webinar that for those of you who are interested in learning more about what a net zero stretch code is, um, and you can look at Travis's really lovely slides to understand what net zero buildings, how they can be uh, categorized in different ways, uh, please come to the webinar and we can uh, prepare you uh, for speaking uh, and submitting written uh, comments to the BBRS. And lastly, another one of our agenda items for bringing uh, all of us together is to really hammer home this idea that if you're a designer, uh, if you're an engineer, um, if you uh, are a volunteer in an environmental nonprofit, uh, that there are always opportunities to really push for legislation. And, you know, it seems like with the passage of the climate bill into law and with a flurry of really interesting bills this session, it's really worthwhile to get to know some of these pieces of legislation. And this morning, the HERO Coalition, which is a coalition of affordable housing and climate groups, 
uh, held a briefing uh, for legislators, uh, especially. And they have put together, uh, the coalition has put together uh, a bill SD 611 or HD 1252. And this is really uh, an interesting piece of legislation um, that would double the current deeds excise tax uh, and uh, with the selling of property in Massachusetts. And the, the revenue projections are about 300 million uh, dollars of new revenue annually that would be uh, allocated, 150 million would be allocated and set aside for housing, both uh, the preservation and the uh, production of affordable housing. And then another 150 million would be dedicated uh, and administered through the Global Warming Solutions Trust Fund, uh, focusing on both climate mitigation and climate adaptation measures. So when we send out these slide decks, there are embedded links in these last two slide uh, slides uh, that will allow you to access information about how you can follow up on the BBRS webinar uh, and also learn more about this particular piece of legislation. So with that, I would just like to thank you all for being on this call. Um, I noticed that there's been a flurry in the chat. Uh, we will capture, again, we will capture that chat and send it out uh, thank you, Rose, for dropping in that webinar link. Send it out to all of you on the call uh, this afternoon. And before we go, I just want to give a big shout out to Travis and to Brenda, Mariana and Bill. Uh, I think this was really informative. Uh, and we covered a lot of ground today. And, you know, buildings, we know how to make them better. Uh, and net zero is affordable to do. And we're already doing it. So, uh, a big, uh, a big thank you for all of you for staying on this call and for our speakers and for BSA co-hosting this with MCAN this afternoon. So be well, stay in touch, and um, let's go forward. Net zero now. Excellent. <laughs> Take care, everybody.